Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a new lecture within our Jamonet Open Online course of European integration. Uh, today's topic is one of the most important topics of our uh, lecture series this year, because today's topic is one in which we will combine different topics that we have seen along the different um, uh, weeks of the course. And today we will discuss the EU economic development and democratization. If you remember, our course is a Jamonet Open Online course of European integration that is financed by the European Commission through the Erasmus Plus program and in concrete, through the Jamonet actions. It's a part of a Jamonet chair at the University of Yash. And we have to say this, I always say this because it's um, compulsory in a sense. And it's compulsory not only because we must be thankful to the European Commission and to the European Union in general for the funding for this course, it is also compulsory for YouTube and it's also compulsory for transparency so that you know who pays for this course, so that there is no conflict of interest. You should know who pays for this course. So today's topic um, links two very important groups of issues within our course. On the one hand, economic development. On the other hand, democratization. In the Jamonet Open Online course of European integration, we have learned about the European Union, how the European Union works, how the European Union is a political system that has a number of institutions that we could uh, call democratic institutions. It has a European Parliament, it has um, European elections, it has an executive, it has people trying to influence legislation by lobbying, it has the Eurobarometer that measures public opinion, uh, in in Europe, it looks very much like a political system and we have analyzed much of it using the same tools that we use to analyze other political systems. This is called comparative politics, to compare different uh, political systems. And this helps us understand how the European Union works, which is the objective. Our course is especially interesting for students who have been, um, have studied other degrees that are not particularly related to European integration. For instance, Christian Hritzkan, Christian Hritzkan from Radautz. He has studied uh, psychology before. And when he studied psychology, probably he didn't have many courses about the EU. On the other hand, Antonia Nitsa has studied European studies before, international relations and European studies. Probably she knows more about this. Most of our students come from countries like. Romania, Ukraine, which are countries that have um, joined the European Union relatively recently, Romania in 2007, or who would like to join the European Union in the future, or would like to consider the possibility of joining the EU in the future and are curious about how the EU works. And our course have dealt, as I said, uh, with the institutions, with the democratic institutions that the EU has, what the European Union does, the policies of the EU, and also how these policies are um, decided 
the decision-making procedures and how people try to influence those decision-making procedures and those policies through elections, through lobbying campaigns, and so on. But this year, our course has been particularly focused on economic development because this course that we offer and is very popular in Ukraine, for instance, in some of our partner universities, such as the University of Chernivtsi, uh, which is in the Bukovina region, that is a border region uh, together with um, Romania. Um, we also have uh, a few students, increasing number of students from Zhitomir, which is another Ukrainian city that is close to Kyiv, it's more to the north than Chernivtsi. And uh, we have uh, made um, a new agreement also with the University of Odessa, National University of Odessa. We still do not have many students from Odessa, just one or two, but the idea is that Ukraine is where our course is very popular this year. And of course, we have our main students, our basis is also in Romania, students from Yash and students from Suchava that take this course as part of their degree programs. Because we offer this course in Ukraine, and because some of the people who take this course in Ukraine, ah, Cornelia, welcome. Some of the people who take this course in Ukraine take it voluntarily, and take, they are so interested in, in the topics that they take it in different years, the same course. So they have taken it last year, and they take it this year. What we do, is that while keeping our um, general topic related to the European Union and to European integration, we try every year to offer a different specialization within the analysis of the EU and European integration. And this year, we have decided to uh, focus on economic development. Economic uh, development is a very important issue in general. In the field of economics, it has been the most important topic since Adam Smith, who wrote The Wealth of Nations. He is considered sometimes like the, the father of economics, the study of the economy. His topic, his interest was in economic development. That's why he analyzed the wealth of nations, why some nations uh, are uh, wealthier than others, what makes some nations wealthier and makes some nations develop more, grow more. And we have seen many topics on economic development. But in today's lecture, what we will do is to combine both things to combine what we saw about economic development on the one hand and what we saw about democratic institutions on the other hand. And we will try to answer the question whether the European Union contributes to economic development and to democratization by relating both fields, the field of economic development and the field of democratization. <clears throat> and um, I have to tell you a story because we have many people from Suchava connected today. We have Carmen Astase from Suchava. We have Cornelia who has just joined. We. I would like to see Cornelia with the picture because um, it would be really, really good for the course if she could have a webcam to 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 appear on the video. We also have Christian Kritzkan who studies in Yash, but he's from Radouts. And I tell you a story about a little village in near. 
Ah, welcome, Miss Paduraru. Thank you very much for your presence today. This will be probably the best uh, lecture in the whole year. Thank you all very much. So, <clears throat> the the uh, I was telling you about a small village uh, near Suchava. The the name of the village is Hentsesht. Probably you know Hentsesht. It's close to Suchava. It's just uh, ten minutes away from Suchava. And uh, once I I was there in that village. I was invited because it's the the village where um, the 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 pre the parents the mother of my of my wife come from and i was invited there for 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 lunch or for dinner i don't remember and i met a very important person there really really important person especially important for this course we're taking now he's no longer with us he he passed away already he was an old man and and he passed away but i learned something very important from from him when we were discussing about politics because i like discussing politics with with the people with everyone yes and especially with the people who know more the the the, the those who have more experience like in this case domino mircea and he said, this country is so corrupt, it's, uh, it's full of thieves. There are so many politicians, so many members of parliament, so many local councillors, so many uh, uh, I don't know, presidents and, and at national level and at the uh, provincial level Concilio Giudiziano and Primaria and so many institutions and so many politicians and they are all corrupt and they are all thieves and with one committee of 10 people it would be enough to rule this country with one committee of 10 people, it would be enough. We do not need thousands of corrupt politicians. Just with 10 people, 10 selected people, committee of 10 people. Un comitet cusece women. And I remember this. It's enough to rule this country. And I thought about that. And I said, I think I understand him. If, on the one hand, if one country is ruled by a committee of 10 people only, the country, by international standards, probably is not considered a very democratic one. But on the other hand, if you live in a village, yes, where I, I was there, invited there, and um, I was eating there, and at some point I asked to my wife, can I go to the toilet? And she told me, do you really need to go now or can you wait? And I said, well, I can I can wait if necessary. Why? It's before that you wait because uh, they do not have a toilet at home. And if you want to go to the toilet, you have to go out now it's in the snow. We have 30 centimeters of snow and you have to to go to a special place like a toilet outside the house because they do not have running water in the house and they do not have toilet in the house. So if you can wait, it's better to wait and then you go elsewhere. And then I understood 
I understood that if you don't even have a toilet, if you, your your troubles, your problems, what you expect from the political system is very basic things, and you cannot afford to pay so many politicians, to pay so many members of parliament to discuss among themselves and they do not agree on anything and that's why he said a committee of 10 people would be enough to rule this country because when you are poor you do not need democracy so much because democracy is so expensive democracy is a luxury if you look at it in world terms, democracy is a luxury. It's very expensive to what he said, to pay so many politicians. Yes. So <clears throat> this this, uh, this idea that um, democracy is, is expensive and that usually the the there is a correlation between economic development and democracy. It has been analyzed empirically, and they have found some correlation. It is not perfect correlation. Yes, there are exceptions. There are countries that are poor that are democratic and countries that are very rich and they are not democratic. But there is a correlation. Yes. and this can be explained and this can be explained by something that we have not discussed yet probably that is called the theory of clubs usually when people um, think about goods in, in economic terms they differentiate sometimes public goods and private goods Yes, but there is something in between that is called club goods. And club goods are uh, similar to, to, to public goods in a sense that um, their consumption is non rival. Someone else can consume the same good and you do not lose from that up to a certain point when there is congestion. And also they are similar to private goods in the sense that you can be excluded from consuming the good. If you are not member of the club, you cannot consume it. It will be much easier for you to understand when we apply this to real examples. <clears throat> Imagine that um, you have a bus you have a bus yes or you have a tramway bus yes or a train if one person uses the train he enjoys traveling by train if a second person uses the train the first person enjoys the same it's no problem for the first person if a third person uses the same train and a fourth and 10 people 20 people it's no problem yes the consumption is non rival the fact that someone else enjoys benefits from the train does not reduce the benefit to the existing people up to a certain point when the train is already very full, if an additional person comes, there's congestion already and there are problems. There are not places where you can sit and so on. But until that point is reached, consumption is non rival, such as public goods. But at the same time, different from public goods, for instance, a public good, a typical one, is clean air. If you enjoy breathing clean air, 
they cannot exclude you from that or the sunshine you enjoy the sunshine they cannot put like a shade on you but in the case of a train they can say if you don't pay the ticket you don't use the train so this is a club good like a train a train is a club good where consumption is non-rival until there is congestion and where people can be excluded from using the train and this means that this this new third category of goods in addition to public goods and private goods there's this club goods in between that are very very interesting and that can help us understand very important i put you in mute le hatch can help us understand very important issues about economics and about politics. And I was telling you about Dr. Mircea and about this statement. This country is full of thieves, politicians who are thieves. This country could be ruled by a committee of 10 people. well what you have to understand is that people join clubs to save money when you go by train you go by train because it's cheaper than going by car maybe yes when you go to a swimming pool a public swimming pool you go there to this club because it's cheaper than having your own private swimming pool when you go in an airbus plane from romania to milan it is because it's cheaper than going in your private jet When you go somewhere by taxi and you share the same car with many other people using the same taxi, it's because it's cheaper than having your own car with your own driver. So people join clubs because it is cheaper. They would prefer if they have the money if they had the resources they would prefer to have very small clubs but if they are poor they will have large clubs so the size of clubs the optimal size of clubs depends on the level of development yes so if you are a very poor person yes you can have a tractor that belongs to the cooperative and the tractor serves all the peasants in a certain village for instance if you are richer maybe you will have a tractor only for your small village or for three colleagues and you share a tractor not for the whole cooperative if you are even richer you will have a tractor just for yourself and your family and if you are even richer you may have one tractor for you and one tractor for your son and one of them is painted green and the other one is painted yellow so the theory of clubs tells us that the optimal size of clubs is reduced with economic progress and development and this also applies to politics when you need to live in a country 
and you need to to be ruled by someone to provide some services such as security for instance and you need to be ruled by someone if you are very poor you will say a single person one dictator is enough to rule this country i cannot afford to pay so many crook politicians if you are not so poor you can say a committee of 10 people is enough to rule this country but if you are very rich then you will want to have the possibility to to vote for your local politician for your mayor and you would like to have your own member of parliament and your own senator from your village that goes to Bucharest to represent you. It's more expensive to pay so many politicians. Yes, but this is explained by the theory of clubs. And this is an introduction to help us understand today's topic which is you shouldn't forget this the eu economic development and democratization how does the eu affect democracy how does the eu affect economic development good so georgiana what do you say Hi. Hi. Where are you now, Georgiana? I'm in my sleeping room. Aha. It's such a nice place. You look as if you have like a special studio for our for our online lectures. Yeah. I have another room, but uh, I chose to not stay there today. It looks so good. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good. Lehach. Hello? We cannot hear you. You are in mute. Technology is not helping us. You, yes. you are in mute. Hi. Now. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Where are you now? Uh, I arrived home. I'm in my home. My in Yash? Yes, in Yash. Good. Thank you very much for your presence today. You see, our colleagues from um, Ukraine are not present today because of the differences in the academic calendar between Romania and Ukraine. So it makes it very difficult for them to get together in this period when they already have exams or they have different uh, a different schedule to ours thanks for your presence yeah we are there christian Hitzkan. yep how is it going in radout well weather is not very good but everything else is fine do you know Hentesh? I heard of it, but I don't know personally. Do you know Domnu Mircea? No, unfortunately. Do, do you, did you understand this idea? Yes, yes, yes. A committee of 10 people is enough to rule this country for a person who doesn't have much money and can not afford yes it's like someone who says with 10 cars it's enough for the city of yash and we share them right and other people when you have more money you say i want to have my own car do do you do you own a car yes i do and uh, 
your parents do they have one car for them well my parents doesn't have cars. they don't have yes and do you have brothers or sisters i do have a one brother at with, home with no you? he lives in ireland aha uh -huh. he emigrated to ireland yes, right? yes. a while ago yes so at home how many people are you in your home your parents and you mm, it's only myself and my family my wife and my children and ah, my mother, my does, mother. You, does your wife have one car no we have only one car and your children are young still right yes, very young yes okay so the idea is that when a country develops the number of cars per person increase yes and you will have one family and maybe you will have your own car and your wife will have her own car and when you have like uh, bigger children they will also have their own car and also the grandparents of those children they will also have their own car yes because people they like different colors of cars people they like to be free to use the car when they need it and they do not like sharing so much sometimes they share to save money yes it's the same with politicians yes you can share a dictator for a whole country or you can have representatives from the different regions or from the different provinces of the different municipalities yes good it was this clear or not the idea i mean the, the general idea good i don't know if cornelia is there or not because I, we cannot see her on on video yes or Antonia, if she's still there, but if they want, they can participate. We have Maria Cherednichenko that uh, says hello to everyone from YouTube. And we have Daniela Muscar, who also says hello from you, YouTube. Maria Cherednichenko is from Chernivtsi, and Daniela Muscar is from Suchava, but we have six simultaneous connections on youtube at the moment thank thank you all very much for your presence if you are watching on youtube and if you like this video please give it a like if you don't like it give it a thumbs down dislike and, and if you like it very much you share it with your friends if you don't like it you share it with your enemies and it, it's um, to show that you have been present when, when you write now on the chat your name it appears there but it disappears afterwards the best thing is that you write a comment to the video because this will remain yes that is to show that you have watched the, the video on youtube thank you very much so in this course we have discussed the how the EU and European integration relates to economic development. And the, the Antonia Nitsa says that she has switched off the video because it makes the quality of the, of the video conference be better for her. Afterwards, she will be able to watch if, if she likes because this is being broadcast on YouTube, but at the same time, it will remain re recorded afterwards you can watch it later if you like and usually on youtube there's good mm, good quality so we discussed economic development and issues such as how trade affects economic development and from the wealth of nations we have said that free trade is good for economic development and we have also said that the eu with its um, common market, it's a free trade initiative because it makes trade free in a block of countries with 500 million people. 
it is the biggest trading bloc in the world. And there's free trade among the members, the 28 members of the European Union. And we said, in principle, free trade should be a good thing for development. We saw also some exceptions, some small um, caveats, such as we discussed the, the idea that the trade liberalization of the EU is discriminatory in a sense because the EU has free trade with its members of the club, but not free trade with third countries. So when there's trade liberalization that is discriminatory just for some countries and not for others, there can be one problem that is called trade diversion. And we discussed the case of the North Romania, the best trade diversion, it will be more important in some countries than in other countries. Yes, because trade diversion means that because of the EU, because you have now Lidl that sells chocolate from Germany, and because this chocolate does not have to pay customs taxes, then this chocolate is cheaper for you than the chocolate from Ukraine that you used to buy before that now has to pay customs duties. This would be trade diversion. Yes, if you are in Poland and before you used to buy Russian vodka, but now because you are in the EU, there's free trade with Finland and Finnish vodka is cheaper, not because it's really cheaper, but because it does not have to pay customs taxes and Russian vodka still has to pay them, then there could be trade diversion. But these are small exceptions. I think there may be some problem with the connection because some people are uh, disconnecting the the video at the moment but the the main idea is that if we look empirically we see that there's convergence among the countries of the eu we see that the fastest growing countries in the eu are countries such as romania which are the poorest countries of the eu and they are the ones that are growing faster and this can be explained by economic theory. Yes, it's called convergence, but it does not happen for every country. Maybe Tanzania or Afghanistan or Libya are also poor, but they do not converge with the EU. But Romania does at a very fast pace. Yes. And we say at a very fast pace, but still for some people, the pace can be not fast enough. They say, well, it takes so long because convergence needs capital accumulation. And this takes long. We have said that this can take up to 50 or 70 years to fully converge. Yes. So it's a very, very slow process. If you think in, in terms of a lifetime of a person, but it's a very fast process if you think in, in broader terms, yes? So it's a question sometimes of expectations, we said. Uh, once we know that the the, EU will not make all countries equal in two years, that it takes longer, then we can understand more what happens in the EU and be more understanding in a sense. Good. This is about economic development. But how about democratization? We have discussed in one special lecture whether 
development aid is good for democracy. I think we have a seminar question about that. And we said that there are some people that said that not always. Yes. When the EU has a development policy with third countries, does the EU encourage democracy? In theory, yes. The EU tries to promote democracy, but in practice, there can be some people that say, well, what the EU wants is to protect its interest in, in other countries. And this does not necessarily mean to promote democracy. If a dictator can help you achieve your goals, you can promote a dictator. Yes. In the case of um, the refugee problem, for instance, it's a very good example. Now the refugees, they are concentrated in refugee camps. And some of these camps, they try to make them in places such as Radouts in Romania, but they didn't have much success. And they ended up having these refugee camps in countries such as Turkey. And more, many of the refugees complain that the conditions there are not <coughs> good conditions. For, uh, they do not respect human rights or whatever. But the EU needs to solve this problem. And if it needs to negotiate with a country such as Turkey, it negotiates with Turkey. But furthermore, if you know now, in the case of Libya, do you know Libya, Christian? Uh, yes, I, I've never been there, but I know Libya, yes. Libya, as I understand, is a country that has close historical ties with Italy. It's close to Italy, and also many of the refugees that arrived in Italy arrived through Libya, even though they came from, from the sub-Saharan Africa, from, from Central Africa, yes? Or, but they, they go through Libya, yes? And they arrived mm, by boat in Italy. Now, Italy has an interior minister, home affairs minister, that is very popular in Italy, and it is very popular in the European Union as well, because he has managed to solve the refugee problem somehow, reduced it very much. The number of refugees that arrived in, in, in Italy. And you know what he did, Christian? No, 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 please, please tell us. He, <clears throat> he went to Libya that uh, after the overthrow of the previous dictator Gaddafi, it's in a state of war, a tribal wars between different tribes and so on. And uh, he arrived there in Libya and he started to negotiate with the leaders of the tribes in Libya and asking them for help to stop the refugees that passed through Libya and arrived in Italy. And he was very successful. You know why? He boasted that he was successful because when he was negotiating with these mm, small dictators, you know, these warlords, these uh, heads of the tribes in Libya, he said that in the beginning they were reluctant but once he told them that he was from Calabria and that people in Calabria, they signed the pact, the agreement with blood, and then they started trusting him and he solved the immigration problem in 
in the EU. Yes, because he negotiated with some small dictators in in Libya. Yes, and now the European Union is very proud of him because the statistics show that he really managed to reduce the number of immigrants in the EU. Yes, but on the other hand, the NGOs, the NGOs that care about the welfare of refugees and so on, they started to complain that these refugees who want to come to the EU are being abused in Libya, in a country that does not respect human rights. Yes? So it's a difficult thing. In the case of Spain, the problem with immigration has been also a long-standing problem. And immigrants to Spain come from Africa, and Africa is very close to Spain. They can even swim sometimes. If they are good swimmers, they can swim to Spain. Yes? It's just a few kilometers. And they have to come through Morocco. And the Spanish government has solved the refugee problem or reduced the refugee problem by making agreements with the monarchy of Morocco. And some of these agreements, they, they, they include what is called the hot uh, devolution. How do, I don't know how to translate it hot return or something like that yes it means that when someone some refugee or some some immigrant jumps the wall that spain has with morocco the spanish police can open one door and return it to morocco and the moroccan authorities will accept him once he was already in Spain, because he jumped, he managed to jump the wall, but the police catch him, open one door, and return him without any legal uh, judicial procedures for extradition or something like that. It's called like hot return. And it has also been very criticized by NGOs caring about human rights even sometimes by the EU, but the EU criticizes it, but at the, on the other hand, it realizes that if you don't do that, the number of refugees will increase much more. So very often the EU member states and probably the EU itself, they make agreements with governments that are dictatorships. And these agreements, of course, they are not like, you should become a democracy. Otherwise, we have no agreement. No, sometimes they say, you are what you are, we understand you, and we negotiate with you and we adapt. So does the EU promote democracy? In general, I think it does, yes? It says so, it says it does, even though there are some examples as the ones I mentioned that where you see that not necessarily, yes? But <clears throat> the idea is not looking at these cases where there are dealings, political dealings with other countries, but at the idea that we mentioned before that the European Union creates convergence, economic convergence, and makes that the poor regions grow faster than the rich regions of Europe. And you remember when we talked about Domnul Mircea, and when we talk about how democracy is expensive, but 
with economic development, democracy can increase. So does the EU promote democracy, for instance, in countries such as Romania? Well, the EU needs to get things done, needs to resolve immigration problems, yes? And maybe if the EU needs to create a refugee camp in Romania, and in order to create this refugee camp in Romania, they need the approval of the uh, president of the provincial council in the region, maybe it's cheaper for them to offer some particular benefits to this person in order to have the refugee camp. And maybe they do that. And you would say, oh, but this is not good for democracy. But the EU, the single market, the possibility for people to work in other countries, the possibility for Ocean, for Carrefour, for Kaufland, for other uh, companies to arrive in Romania, the possibility for Siemens, for Oracle, for uh, many other foreign companies to invest in Romania. This is, a, this is something that generates economic development. And if economic development generates democracy, then this can be good for democracy in a way. But my message for the Romanian people is that the EU itself is governed by people from different European countries, and each of them is elected democratically. They have to stand for elections, but sometimes they have to stand for elections in Germany, or in France, or in the UK, or in, uh, in Italy, and they care about the interests of their voters. And sometimes th this does not necessarily mean that they have to promote democracy in the world, and not even in all the European Union member states. The democratization of Romania is something that the Romanian people have to care about because they cannot expect that this will be automatically promoted by some German elected politician, elected by the German voters, or some um, Italian minister elected by the Italian voters. It has to be the Romanian people. But the European Union, by helping Romania develop by helping Romanian people to increase their living standards makes it much easier for Romania to democratize because it makes that people who are increasingly richer in Romania demand more democracy and are more critical with their own political systems when they are not democratic. I don't know if this idea has been understood. Georgiana. <laughs> yes, I understood the idea. It's important. So it's something that you cannot expect the European Union automatically to make Romania democratic. Because the EU wants to get things done. Yes? And the politicians who rule the EU, they are elected in different countries, not by the Romanian people alone. And they have to defend the interests of those people in order to be re-elected, in, in order to remain in power. And that sometimes it's even cheaper, as it was in the case of Libya. If you go and you make a deal with some uh, leaders of the tribes in Libya. Yeah. Yes? And you get things done. 
and people praise you and the voters in italy say you are a very good minister because you have reduced the number of immigrants in the country <clears throat> so does the eu promote democracy sometimes it may have an interest yes if there's some dictator <clears throat> that is not doing what the european union needs maybe they promote democracy but not always and not, not, it's not something that you can automatically expect but at, at the same time if you are able to work in a call center in Yash and you earn more money and instead of earning 200 euros per month now you earn 500 euros per month your demand for democracy your democratic standards increase and you no longer say like don Mircea, a committee of 10 people is enough to rule this country you say i can afford a bit more good christian yes, yes. What do you think about it? Did you know about this um, Italian minister? Well, I, I read something in the newspaper, some, something online, but it's a while ago. He's very popular in Italy. In fact, people, some people, they, they think that he could be the next prime minister of Italy. He's like uh, proposed by people, he's like a candidate to prime minister. Yes, and in the EU, they also look at him with good eyes because he has really solved an important problem for the EU, which is immigration. And sometimes they 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 cite him as an example. Well, he solved only one part of the immigration, but there is something, you know. So. I don't know if he's able to do that to, to each country to go and do whatever he done in. Uh... Well, they say that other people could do the same. Yeah. And, 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 but, you know, the NGOs, they say that, you know, the, the people in Libya now, people, the black people from more to the south of Africa, they arrive in Libya and they become slaves in Libya. And they are raped and they become slaves and so on. But they are stopped. They are imprisoned there and so on. But if you are a person from Italy, you, you don't, don't know what happens in Libya, you don't care very much. You just see that immigration has been reduced and you're happy about it. Yes. If you are in an NGO that looks after the immigrants you don't like it so much you know another thing this minister did is that the in italy there were some ngos that had boats in the sea and that rescued the immigrants that were on, on the sea were about to to die in, on the, in the sea and, and they get them to italy but now he said that these boats do not have a right to dock in italy so if the ngo picks up and rescues some immigrants they can go with them somewhere else but they are not accepted in italy He was successful. Well, to some people, but other, he wasn't very good, you know. So, oh, it's always like that. It's two but, sides, yes. But to a majority of people, to those who will vote for him, it was very successful. Yeah. He was very successful. And to uh, the European Union leaders, also, yes. People in Germany, for instance, they say, ah, fewer immigrants. 
are arriving. It's a good thing. Good. <clears throat> the hatch. Yes. What do you think about the idea whether the EU promotes democracy or not? Yeah, to a certain extent, by their projects, they they promote democracy. Uh, <clears throat> but for instance, uh, I have a question for you because you are from Romania, right? Yes. I remember that uh, at a given point, it, there were um, presidential elections in Romania. And uh, the current president was elected, Klaus Johannes, right? Yes. The and at that time, there was a government in Romania. It was the Ponta government. Yes. It was supported by the uh, Socialist Democratic uh, Party yes. of Romania. And after the new president came, he changed the government, the Ponta government, that had won the elections, and he put a government of technocrats. Yes. Headed by by Cholos, by 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 a very prestigious uh, bureaucrat that had been um, in Brussels. Uh, in Brussels, in, it's, uh, he was a commissioner for agriculture. Yeah. yeah. Is it democratic to overthrow a democratically elected uh, government and to put in place a technocratic uh, government that was not elected by people? Actually, this is not uh, democratic. And uh, But th there was another, from my perspective, there was another point. Uh, they agreed each other in the... The Socialist Party, uh, it was in their interest to let somebody else govern so they can prepare and win the next election. And another issue was Dragna was um, somehow in conflict and, and wished to take uh, the position of president, uh, worked somehow so that it was something that um, they, you know, so managed. You, you to say that the, the, so the socialist. The, the Social Democratic Party, uh, some parts of this party allowed this to Yeah, happen. yeah, it, it was allowed because it but, was in their interest. But anyway, is it democratic or not? No, it's not democratic. And then... The, par the party who won the election should lead the, you know, the government. This is democratic. And when, then with this um, prestigious technocrat from Brussels... Cholos, he ran for the next elections? No, he is a stupid guy. I don't understand him. Um, he now he wants to be to 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 to, to have a party. He has a platform called platform. He, he worked. He is not a politician right now, but he intends to enter into politics. Uh, but the so point he, he intends to to. To be prime minister again? No, I don't think that he will be a prime minister. Maybe we don't know in the future. He intends to to take some votes. You know, the point is that I I didn't understood why he played this game, Cholos. He was he supported two parties, like PMP in uh, PNL, but he didn't want to 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 be in a party. He. He just supported them from outside, thinking somehow they, that he can attract all the votes in his interest. He, his desire was to continue to be a prime minor, prime minister of Romania, but uh, I think that he had they had a problem. This is not this is this uh, was not the best choice to have but Cholos there. Say, so, for instance, in this case, you say that the EU. What did the EU do about uh, the appointment of Cholos as prime minister and the removal no, I, of Ponta? 
no, the you maybe the you advised, you know, uh, uh, Klaus Johannes selected the Cholos uh, because he was considered a very good technocrat, you know, and uh, he worked in Brussels and somehow he got recommendation from Brussels to have this, but uh, it was a wrong idea. It was a wrong movement to to do this because uh, they lost in the end. But but in in other cases, for instance, the the EU has defended democracy in Romania. For in the case of um, when what was his name, Basescu was suspended. Yeah, when when Basescu was suspended, uh... the EU defended that he Basescu had been elected by the people. Yeah, you know, Basescu somehow he he worked from Brussels. He, now, when he is not a president, uh, he criticized Brussels. But before, he was supported by Brussels. Uh, he was uh, he worked very well with them, the commissioner with uh, with everything. Uh, with yes, the the, the the EU, for instance, <laughs> also has some conflicts now. With some member states such as uh, Poland. Hungary or Poland. Poland. Poland, yeah, they say uh, that they are not democratic. So in some cases, the EU like seems to care about democracy they, more than in other cases. Yeah, right? they care about democracy, but I think that they care more about their interest than democracy. Uh -huh. This is my perception. Maybe I am wrong. Let's ask uh, Christian. Well, from what I know, it's like Ponta uh, govern. He just decides to 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 stop it when we it was that uh, fire in Bucharest, if you remember, and that when he stepped down. And from what I remember from TV and also from my friends, Cholos was actually known with like six months beforehand that he will be our next prime minister, which was not news for us. He was sent by Bruxelles and he was on the cards already. Even people didn't know anything about it, but I already had the information that he will be our next uh, prime minister, which I was surprised at the time. I didn't know. And then everybody started talking about technocrats here and technocrats there and whatever. You know, and next thing you know, Cholos came like with big white horse to save the government and whatever. But he, to my knowledge, in my opinion, he didn't do much. But of course, he cannot do too much because technocrats have to be supported by all parties to do something. Or they could propose all sorts of things, but they will not be passed by uh, Congress like Romanian. So do, do you think that uh, the EU promotes democracy in Romania or not? Well, I think, uh, well, of course, they have to promote. Uh, uh, and uh, to my opinion, uh, that was an experiment to Romania to see what happened. I don't think it was not democratic or undemocratic or whatever. It's just an experiment. That's my opinion. And didn't go very well. So uh, you, you at the moment, I think, just let the governments run their courses to see what do they do. And then if they need to interfere, they will interfere because they have to, to, to my opinion, to look after the democracy because next thing you know, we'll sign treaties with Russia or whatever else, you know, which will not be to EU interest at all. So this is what I think. Mm -hmm. How about uh, Georgiana? Well, I'm agreeing with my colleague. I wasn't uh, so familiar with this subject at the time it uh, happened, so I don't have many information about uh, the technocratic uh, govern when it was. But um, I actually agree with Christian what he said. I think it was kind of experiment, and uh, we saw that it uh, didn't go well. They let us to govern our country. I, I have a question for Lehach.
I'm I'm here. It's something that I have been surprised about in in at the universities sometimes, yes, in, in Romania. This this expression maybe you you heard about it. It's the expression is Romania is called dreptul de stampila. Dreptul de stampila? Yes. It says that uh, in one faculty only the dean of the faculty can put the stamp on paper. Yes, yes because rubber uh, stamp. Yeah. Uh, and that uh, things in order to be to 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 be carried out, they need to have this stamp of approval. But only one person has the dreptul de stampila. What do you think about this? Because, you know, coming from, from outside, in, in the beginning, it, I was surprised. I thought it was a very centralized system. Yes? I thought it was a system that did not allow for individual initiative. And I thought it was like a <clears throat> dictatorial system, you know, like everything has to be approved by a single person anything that happens has to be approved by one single person and i thought how is this possible how how do they allow this uh i don't have uh, all the information but i know that not the dean is the one who does everything um, there is a senate you know who coordinates yeah, the, yeah the but the, this rubber stamp is just the dean or the vice deans that are appointed by the dean. Yeah, it's you know it, it has. To, this is the how it works in Romania. You know, if you have a company, you have the right to keep the stamp. You know, uh, you it's somehow yeah, it's a different system. Maybe you don't understand, but this is how it works. Uh, uh, you know the dean is the is the one in charge with everything. You know he is responsible for for everything, and uh, he has a to know. A meeting of one person is enough to rule this faculty. No, 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 no. It, it goes, uh, it goes uh, in another extreme. Uh, it, it becomes, you know, like a sort of dictatorship. But uh, this no, is no, no. It's not like that. Uh, you know how no. it is. It's just uh, he just he, he the guy who puts the stamp. He doesn't approve or disapprove. The, his role is just to make sure everything is in order and he has knowledge of it because there are commissions that they send that paper to him and already the, 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 they have made their own mind, if you know what I mean. They, he just has to stamp it. That's his role. He can't say, look, I'm not going to stamp this. He can't say that because already it's been approved. Once he gets that paper, he has to sign it. It's not like oh, I don't want to put the stamp because I it's something is not is wrong here. Before he gets the paper, everything is in place. You just have to know, knowledge. But there is a law. There is a law. Uh, it came out last year. It says that uh, the stamp is not uh, it's not compulsory. You don't need the stamp because we have a big problem with our companies. Like anytime you go to Fisk or anywhere else, you have to have your stamp with you to stamp everything. If you don't have the stamp, they will send you home with the papers and then you have to come back tomorrow to key you up again. And, you know, but uh, there is a law that says that it, the stamp is not valid anymore. If you have a good, if you don't have it, it doesn't matter, you know. Yeah, but this yeah, is, but for, this companies, is for companies, but, but for, for uh, faculty, you need a stamp on every, on of every piece of paper. There's something else. Hey, he's gone. You're in mute. I I I contradict him saying that, you know, this applies for company, but for university, for every piece of paper you need a stamp and a signature. Yeah, but the stamp the stamp is not in the way that says approve or disapprove. Before you get no. the paper to put the stamp, it's already been approved. You know, so it's just it's just uh, to, just to, to yeah yeah to, yeah. 
It's something that proves that the paper is original. That's the yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the it's not, doesn't have other values. It just proves that the paper is original, and because the stamp and the signature uh, uh, says that the paper is hundred percent original, and that way you are able to use that paper in the way which is normal. Because anybody could uh, type a few words and says, "Look, I'm some lectors or some doctor somewhere else," and signature and stamp but if you don't have the proper signature and the proper stamp that doesn't certify the paper you have so to my opinion the stamp is just to certify that that paper is true you know and it's not falsified but, but the, the the here the idea is not against the stamp i understand it's about the, one single person that he puts the, the he has the power to, to why, why not every teacher can have the stamp Well, I think the teachers, some teachers, they do have. No? How is in Spain, for example? If you want to obtain a paper in Spain, that... It's less centralized. You know? Yes. Maybe if, there, if there's some person who, who has the equivalent of this idea of the stamp thing, mm -hmm. it's not just one person per faculty or not just three people per faculty yes maybe it is 20 people or 40 or 50 people per faculty but this is relates to the idea of the theory of clubs you need to provide this important service that you mentioned the the to prove the that something is authentic yes yes what I meant, yeah. but you can do this you have a club where you share the authenticator for the whole club just one or you can have more it's like in your home you can have just one car for all the family well, because you say it's important that people know how to drive yes but you so know we, we just have one car yes but you know we one coming, certified driver yeah we're coming from uh, from uh, communist regime ceausescu regime so at the time everything came down to one person the director of the school or director of whatever and he was like i don't know how to he was the godfather of everything you know so if he approved he said, put the stamp and signature, that means it's okay. If he didn't put the signature and the stamp, that means everything is no good. So we, in the way, yes, you're right in what you're saying. We are laid back a little bit. We're still using the old system. We didn't... But, uh, but maybe this is in accordance with the level of development. Uh, of course, of course, of course. I because, would say another point is... To, to give this power of authentication to someone, it's a risk because they can use it for corruption or something. It has been used in the past. But if, if, the, if the dean earns 2,000 euros per month and if he does corruption, he loses his job and he loses a lot of money. Of course. But you cannot give the stamp to teachers who just earn 600 euros per month or 400 because then they Again. Can be corrupt of course and it's expensive to give teachers proper wages so that they will not be corrupt so what i just wanted it's something for you to think about to think about examples and so on. the idea of how the economic Development can be related to democratic development with the help of this theory, the theory of clubs. Yes? Okay. Do you have any questions or comments? 